Hello and welcome to the Sunday morning service at Redditch Baptist Church. I'm sorry that we're not actually in the building, but the next best thing, we're together online. So, today I'm going to talk about the way. And I'm taking the text from uh, John 14, 1 to 14. We'll study that together in a moment, but first, let's play. Let's uh, let's worship God together. learn a little bit. We're going to read straight from scripture, John 14, 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house there are many rooms. If that were not so I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you. 
I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know him. You do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I and the Father, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Reading scripture is wonderful. It's an absolutely brilliant way uh, to get to know God. But the, con the Bible is never read in a vacuum. We always have uh, other things coming in and we tend to interpret things by our modern Western minds. So context is incredibly important. In this passage, there are a few areas where we could benefit from knowing the context. So for example, John's Gospel. There's John just to the uh, to the left of Jesus. It's John not Mary as Dan, uh, Dan Brown would have us believe. Um, it's obviously John's Gospel. Who was John's Gospel written by? It was written by John who was the youngest disciple and who self-identifies as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It was written, well, traditionally, people think around AD 85, so we're talking about maybe 50 years after the events. But modern scholarship has pu pushed it back to the 50s or 60s, so within 20 years, 20 to 30 years of the actual events themselves. Um, so it, it's a very close eyewitness record. Who is it written to? The people who John had in mind when he was writing were probably believers already, but people who have come out of uh, the um, the Greek th uh, Greek philosophies, uh, who were familiar with Plato and Aristotle and that gang, um, possibly not Diogenes, uh, <laughs> but um, people who were. Uh, conversant in philosophy uh, and people who were able to think about quite deep things. And who is it, what was it written for? Well, John tells us that himself. He tells us that the reason that this was written, well, don't take it from me, let's take it from his words. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is, um, so, that's John 20, 31. So, it's that you may believe, and in, by believing, you may have life 
in his name. Within this passage, though, we would, where, what's this passage all about? The original audience. These two chaps to the right of Jesus, Thomas and Philip. Um, Thomas was an incredibly good-looking chap who visited the children's talk uh, last week, uh, or a couple of weeks ago. Um, remarkably attractive man, uh, though the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, he was practical. He had a very practical mind. But he was... Some, something, something we can definitely take away from Thomas um, is that he was honest. He wasn't proud about and said, No, oh, yes, I understand everything, like a modern theologian might do. Um, he was uh, very honest about not understanding certain things. And in that honesty, he had sufficient humility to say, I don't understand explain it to me he was as a teacher i can say he was the perfect pupil i love a pupil who comes uh, a student who comes to me and says i don't understand help me to understand so much easier than fighting with a pupil who says no no i know everything i know everything everything there is to know there's nothing you can tell me and what about philip philip is the other um the other chap in the in the equation well, he's similarly practical. On the feeding of the 5,000, it's, it's Philip who asks how they should go about feeding the 5,000. His name is Greek, and there's a, it's, it's hinted at that he was a link to the Greek community. He's most prominent in John for the Greek thinkers I had referred to earlier to relate to. So these are the two the two voices, voices of um, practicality and uh, philosophy. Let's look, look at the where, where it was said. It was said at the Last Supper. Are you all familiar with the, the Last Supper? Jesus had acted in supreme humility beforehand by washing his disciples' feet. A task usually reserved for the lowliest servant. Um, think about uh, walking around the streets of, uh, of first century Jerusalem and you would be putting your feet in a lot of dust. You'd be f putting your feet in a, a lot of um, donkey droppings. Uh, you'd be, you know, you, you would, it would not be a particularly pleasant job. The idea of this is that they uh, they would have gone to the Roman baths before. Um, they would get themselves clean, but then they would walk from the baths to the to the, the host's house, and therefore the only bit that needed washing was their feet. That's the idea, and then they're fully clean. Um, he had also sent Jesus by this time to betray him and prepared the disciples for his impending doom. He had predicted Peter's denial also. So the the disciples were feeling a bit confused, um, a little bit down. You know, this, this is a nice, nice, nice festival and he's doing this. Well, what happens immediately after this event? Well, the next thing that Jesus promises at, the, at this Last Supper is that he promises the Holy Spirit, that is the Parakletos. Uh, those of you familiar with Islam will be amused to hear that uh, <laughs> some Muslim apologists claim that, that that refers to Muhammad. That is obviously utter twaddle according to the uh, according to the text. But it's, it's it's fun to watch them um, make these claims and have not it knocked down. Um, then the next thing after that is that they then depart for the fateful garden. Now what's important here to remember here is that this, is, this was this happened at Passover. The meal was important because it commemorated Moses leading the way out of bondage and slavery to the promised land by way of miracles and sacrifice. It was related to the sacrifice of a perfect spotless lamb. 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who said that? Oh yeah, John the Baptist. Who's the city talking about? Hmm. And the application of its blood on the door frames which protected the Israelites. The Lamb died so that the firstborn in the Israelite households didn't. The Lamb died in the place of the firstborn. The firstborn was saved by the blood of the Lamb. This should have been in the disciples' mind as they were eating. And it was in this place, at that time, that Jesus starts talking about his own sacrifice and declares himself to be the way. Now, John's recording of this statement is important in many ways. First, I want to talk about the term I am. It's a phenomenally important term to the Jews. The Septuagint, sometimes written LXX, denoting the 70 scholars who worked on it, was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Greek was the common language of the Roman Empire, and all the Hellenized Jews of Jesus' time would be familiar with it. The translators of the Septuagint translated Yahweh, or Yahovah, or uh, or Yahweh in Exodus 3 14 6 to 16 that is the name of God given out of the burning bush with the term ego eimi we phrase it I am that I am but the original is richer than that Yahweh is which you can see is written down as uh, written down there that's in modern Hebrew next to the ego eimi uh, phrase as well. Um, just do this for you. That's that's Yahweh. That's ego eimi. Uh, the Hebrew it, Yahweh or Yahweh is the Hebrew verb, verb for existence, what we would call to be. But here, it is in the present future and past tense all at once. This is the only example we have of a verb in the eternal tense. This fits what, we've, what we know elsewhere about God being the, the one who was, who is and who is to come. If that wasn't enough, Hebrew does us another sparkling favour. The letters, reading right to left, um, that's better. Uh, the letters reading right to left as Hebrew is written are Yod He Vav He. Each letter denotes a picture and a separate and special meaning. Yod represents a hand. Um, he is like a window and denotes behold. Vav is like a nail. So when written in Hebrew, the name of God can legitimately, legitimately be described with the phrase, Behold the hand, behold the nail. Something no Jew would ever have made up. Knowing all this, we can marvel a little more at Jesus' statements in John. He makes seven or eight I am statements throughout the gospel, each one connected to a special uh, teaching or miracle. The bread of life after feeding the 5,000. I am the light of the world as he combats the darkness of the Pharisees and heals a man born blind. I am the gate and I am the good shepherd as he lays claim to these titles of God from the Old Testament. I am the resurrection and the life, in comfort to a mourning sister before raising her brother Lazarus to life. I am the way, the truth and the life, at the Passover feast, talking about his imminent departure. I am the vine in the garden, as he teaches about his legacy, the Holy Spirit. The eighth possible statement would be where Jesus says, 
Before Abraham was, I am. And miraculously walks through a crowd baying for his blood. The last is the clearest instance of using ego a me as a claim to divinity. Or that he had really bad grammar, but I don't think we, we can claim that. John's Gospel is written in brilliant Greek. Really simple to read, but really profound and beautifully turned. Uh, it's quite a, quite, a, quite a work of mas mastery of the Greek language. So our focus is on Jesus' claim to be the way. Have you ever been following a sat-nav and missed a turn because it didn't tell you soon enough? This happens to me pretty much every time I drive somewhere that I'm unfamiliar with. I sort of miss the old reliance on maps to plan routes and then trying to drive with a big A3 book between you and the steering wheel. <clears throat> it's a miracle I'm still alive, I know. I have used, as a background to this presentation, a roadmap of Redditch. While you're trying to spot where you live and where the church is, I'd like to remind you what it's like for non-Redditchites coming to the town. Many find it confusing and difficult to navigate. For we who are familiar with it, and it's very logical and easy to navigate, with a few big artery roads feeding all the capillary roads, which are in alphabetical order. I am an advocate for the town design of Redditch, with our abundance of trees and our ease of getting around within the town, but it remains a barrier to people coming into the town and trying to avoid the ominous sign, all other Redditch districts, such as this sign, which stands at the amusingly titled Other Road. Yes, I know it's Otha after the Earl of Plymouth Sun, but the spelling is identical. Now try and think about trying to find meaning, purpose, and God in a world full of contradicting claims and paths. When we're all out of lockdown, take a walk down New Street in Birmingham and listen to the claims along that marketplace of ideas. You have Muslims claiming that submission to Allah via Sharia and Muhammad is the way. You have JWs claiming that only 144,000 of them are saved by following Charles Taze Russell. You have Mormons claiming that you can go and be a god on your, of your own planet if you follow Joseph Smith. You have black Hebrew Israelites claiming to be the true Jews and, the only, and only black people can go to heaven. There are humanists, pagans, New Agers, Buddhists, all recruiting for their particularly exclusive way. And you also have some Christians proclaiming that Jesus is the way. Is it any wonder that so many people feel overwhelmed and lost, trying to avoid all other spiritual destinies? As Christians, it is our responsibility to accurately and clearly share with our friends and neighbours the reason for the hope that we have, as per 1 Peter 3.15. Our hope is grounded on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. We have good reason to believe in Jesus, as revealed in the Bible, to be God incarnate, as he repeatedly claims. We have eyewitness testimony, faith, faithfully preserved with an incomparable wealth of manuscript evidence. We have a huge weight of archaeological evidence confirming the details of the New Testament, such as such as the existence of Cana, Capernaum and Jerusalem, as described. We have traditions going back to the early church, the early church fathers, who were persecuted for their faith. And most importantly, we have the witness of the Holy Spirit and his miraculous, life-changing works today. Therefore, when we find Jesus claiming to be the way, we need to understand that statement. I've already alluded to Jesus being the way, in the same way that Moses made a way for the Israelites to return to the promised land via blood and sacrifice of a lamb, dying in place of a firstborn for their salvation. The sacrifice of a lamb 
dying in place of a firstborn for their salvation. Get the connection there. We have to think, what is the way from, what, what is he the way from, and what is he the way to? Like the Israelites in Egypt, we are all in slavery. We may have come into it innocently, like Joseph move, moving his family in, but now we're in a state Jesus describes in John 8.34. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. But, thanks to the cross, Paul can say in Romans 6, 6-7, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. What's the big deal about, about being set free from sin? It's just a few wrong choices, right? No, it's serious stuff. Say to a drug addict, ah, it's, it's just a little heroin, right? Or to a man who's lost his family to an affair, it's just a little fun flirting, right? Or to a woman eating a forbidden fruit in a garden. You will not surely die and curse the whole of humanity, right? No. Sin is rebellion against God, saying, I don't trust you to give me what I want, so I'll take it my own way. And the result of this is also in Romans 6. This time, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Praise God the verse doesn't stop there, though but gloriously continues. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's important to know what you've come from and who you were, but it's also important to know where you're going. Remember the advice from the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Then it doesn't matter. Jesus is the only way for us, or our friends and neighbours, if he is the way to show to something we want to attain. Jesus is clear about what, what he is the way to. No one comes to the Father except through me, the Father. This means that through Jesus we have access to God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, source of all power, all knowledge, all goodness and all love. Imagine what it'll be to be in his presence for a second. But we are promised infinitely more to be in his presence for eternity, never needing anything, never wanting for anything, Never bored or lonely or sad or dissatisfied, but full and overflowing with the very best of life, occupying exactly what we were designed for. In short, heaven. Father God is also regarded as Father for another reason. He is the author of life. Jesus is the way to a better life, a life of purpose. A life of meaning, a life of true prosperity, not just the, the riches of the duplicitous prosperity gospel preachers. Jesus is the way. We are inundated daily with a barrage of truth claims from a wide range of sources. One person will say coronavirus began with bats another with chickens, another from 5G technology, another from vaccinations. We often need to ask Pilate's question, what is truth? To test truth claims, we can use two main tests. The first one is correspondence. 
Does the claim agree with reality? If we say Boris Johnson is the 77th Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, then we can test that against how many previous Prime Ministers there have been. When Jesus claims to be the truth, he is inviting us to test him. That is, in other words, to taste and see that the Lord is good. The second test is coherence. That is, does it measure up with everything else we know about the world? A good illustration of this is William Lane Craig's framing of the Kalam cosmological argument. Bear with me. A lot of long words there. Here we go. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two. The universe began to exist. Therefore, premise three. The universe has a cause. Experience and scientific investigation has put the first two premises beyond debate. The conclusion follows necessarily and is thus an example of coherence. If Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, we should be able to see that this coheres with what we know of the world. Let's see if we can do a similar argument. One, God told Old Testament prophets that he was coming as Messiah. Two, Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies about being the Messiah. Therefore, three, Jesus is God. As God, we can take what he says seriously. My four-year-old daughter has recently started saying in her contented moments, ah, this is the life. This is amusing and encouraging to my wife, and it means that my wife and I, and it means that she's happy and unlikely to throw anything at us imminently. <clears throat> what she means is clear. She is happy and satisfied with her current situation and wishes it to continue. And will throw things at anyone who, who seeks to uh, discontinue it. Perhaps you've had this experience on holiday or even locked down at home. Ah, this is the life I don't have to go into work. This is the life I don't have to interact with other, other human beings. Um, for a certain group of people, that will be true. Um, Jesus declares himself for the second time to be the life. He is the resurrection and the life. But he's also the way to that life. God offers us fullness of life. As I told the rock solid guys last week, John 10.10 10 says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The wonderful news for us is that this abundant life doesn't start at death. Right here, right now at the point of being born again. My daughter doesn't remain in the state of this is the life because she gets bored and starts misbehaving, bringing with it consequences. We are just the same. We're given the grace and ability to live in the fullness of life. But every so often the old man rears up in us and we do something to break the fullness. When that happens, we can praise God that he is forgiving and merciful and allows us to re-enter as many times as we mess it up. We can also resolve yet again to remain in the fullness of life. So, in conclusion, we have seen that Jesus is the way from bondage to sin and death to the glories of the Father in heaven and fullness of life. We have seen that the truth of these claims to divinity that Jesus makes are testable by correspondence and coherence. And we have seen that Jesus does not just offer us new life, but is himself that abundant, full and perfect life in which we can share if we open ourselves to him. Now, 
If I have left you with more questions than answers, then please email me and I will do my best to answer. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.